from poetry to logic to military commands to casual conversations, all in terms of processes first discovered uh, in research on animals. Now, it doesn't surprise me at all if you can show me uh, something like verbal behavior in other species, but I think there are two restrictions. I think you've got to teach it because no other species has developed a language. And remember, I'm talking about a verbal culture when I say language. I don't believe that chimpanzees have a language which is not due to natural selection rather than operant conditioning. And that's a very big distinction. I don't question the language of bees or the language of territorial markers and so on and so on. Those things have proved to be important for the species and they have evolved through natural selection, survival as a consequence, well-being of the individual and survival of the species. And that is that. But they have never developed a language in the sense of a verbal environment which reinforces verbal behavior. That's very important, I think. Um, in the case of the chimps, it's very, you, have to, you can also, well, I think you could also say this for almost all of the species that only in the human species is the vocal musculature under operant control. Now, there are parrots and minor birds and so on that imitate sounds, and once they have done that, you can reinforce particular patterns to get something very, which looks more like uh, human verbal behavior. However, you can use sign languages or lexicons and so on, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and get the same thing in animals that can't control their vocal apparatus. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's that. Now, how far can you go in teaching? Well, that all depends upon how much time you have uh, to arrange the equivalent of the verbal environment which the species doesn't have. And I think the one good reason uh, why they haven't developed that is that the consequences are always slightly deferred, and that makes it very, I don't think you can, I, I would assert this, and I think it's a very, I'd like to have ethologists uh, answer me on this. Is there any species that models behavior not because of natural selection, but because of the offering consequences? I doubt it. I, uh, you know, the experiment of the, the monkeys that started washing uh, the, the sweet potatoes. One did, uh, an accident, I suppose, that uh, a sweet potato in salt water tasted better with a little salt, and it's also cleaner and less gritty. Uh, but that, that young monkey went on doing that. It was never imitated by adults because they don't imitate young. It was imitated by other young. And then when they grew older, the young began to imitate them, and then they all eventually uh, practiced this. But it, and that was due to operant reinforcement. That was not an evolved practice. And could be, there's a mistake, mistake called an, an instinct. If you came upon that, you'd say they had an instinct, unless you knew something about the history of those. Now that, uh, but I don't believe even then, that one of those monkeys ever showed another monkey how to, uh, or to hold it to a coerce it, force it to do this. But I just don't think the consequences of showing, modeling, are quick enough to have been effective in any other species except man. Now, I'd like to know whether that, you can always say something looked like it, but do you find a regular standard practice? Of course you do uh, at the level of natural selection, some birds fly where their young can see them and they're more likely by imitating them to fly sooner. That's, that's modeling, uh, no question about that. And that is, it is the survival of the species that makes a difference. And the problem there is that that is, it is always a, a, it's always a deferred, deferred consequence, the survival of the species or even 
the survival of the individual is always a deferred consequence. But natural selection could work that way. But deferred consequences cannot work on operant conditioning. I don't think animals model behavior, and I don't think they talk to each other unless someone has constructed very specific contingency to reinforce them. And that's, of course, what these people working with chimpanzees do. Um, I want to pursue deferred consequences. You didn't, you didn't intend to say that deferred consequences cannot work in the human case, can you? I mean, a verbal organism mm. can be controlled by deferred consequences. But because of the verbal behavior, you see, I don't believe, I have a big con uh, conflict here with my colleague, Richard Hernstein, I don't believe that net gain ever explains behavior. A net gain, how you come out in the long run, is a product of certain contingencies of reinforcement which are immediate. And there are very good reasons why those immediate consequences have have evolved because they have, in general, produced a net gain for the culture. Net gains are cultural consequences which work only through mediation. If you do this, this will happen. Okay, then I do it because I have learned in response to those if-then statements to do because consequences have followed when I have done. But without the verbal mediation, I don't think any human being is modified by what happens an hour later, let alone a month later, or at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it happens. I, I, I can't imagine how it could have evolved to happen that way. I, I think the, the ongoing behavior has got to be somehow still ongoing to have the reinforcement affected. And, um, and when I worked with rats, uh, three or four seconds begins to damage the whole thing very much. And even then, it may very well be that there are conditioned mediators. Uh, first, and I got a pigeon to do something where something happened 50 minutes later, but we had to move up second by second to get that. And you, you do this now because the condition that follows was something you, you could do something in and so on and so on. You learn to do something because it produces a condition under which something will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And then you have to stretch that period of time out very slowly in the process we call shaping. Mm -hmm. Shaping and chaining we've talked yes, about. Yes, right. Yes. Um, you said that the, how far we can take other organisms, other species, uh, into a verbal mm -hmm. into verbal behavior yes. uh, depends upon how long we have to train them. Yes. Do, do you think that there would be no theoretical limits or no practical limits on how far we can teach uh, another species? Another well, species? I think it's like Chomsky saying that there are an infinite number of sentences uh, for that. You have to say, given an infinite number of amount of time. Uh, and uh, I can't say on this, but I, I would, would make some estimates. Uh, there was someone a long time ago who taught dogs to do things in response to verbal instructions and claim something of the order of, of, of a hundred or more responses. The dog's a listener, though, remember, mm -hmm. in that case, not a speaker. Mm -hmm. Now, you can get, uh, if you can get different kinds of responses, which are really distinguishable as, and of course, one of the great advantages of verbal behavior is the patterning that makes possible thousands of responses in a very short, of a very small size. If you can get several of those, you can get a pigeon, someone has done this recently, you get a pigeon to stand on one foot or to flip one wing and so on. These are words. Uh, you stand on one foot for something, you flip your wings for something else, you nod your head for something else and so on. It can be done. That's the sign language of the pigeon. Uh, you can build up a reasonable repertoire, but you very soon run into trouble. How many different responses have you got? And I'm sure that the sign language is a problem, too, there, because uh, there, there's a point at which they're no longer distinguishable f uh, functionally. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tend to be, even in the human sign language, they tend to be rather sketchy kinds of, of things. But if you could, if there's a question of how many different topographies of response are available, and how much time have you to bring them 
under the control of one, different consequences to ask for different things, two, different, uh, different settings in which they are reinforced, tacting in the terms of my book. That is, uh, you say this when the color is red, you say that when the color is blue, you say that when the color is green, and so on. Do you know the names of the colors? Well, you build, build up, you get half. Maybe by the time you get to 12 or 13, you're getting very, very close on the colors, and they won't have the fancy names like mold and whatnot. But you could go quite a long way, and I don't see any reasonable limit there except the limit, your limit, or the limit of some apparatus you can make to do this more precisely. Uh, you could have, it's the pigeon is pecking the names of things. I've done it with four. Four colors. You turn it on, the pigeon pecks red or uh, whatever the color is. It does it very well. And you could, if you had a much bigger array, as, the, uh, as, as it can be done with the chimps and so on, you can get naming of a large number of things or properties of things. You can get man's asking for things, naming for things. And uh, you can get repetition. Uh, you do it, and, and the organism does it. This is what happens when you teach someone how to say something. Uh, say, uh, say uncle, and you say uncle. And uh, that can be that echoic behavior. You can build that up. Uh, you, I doubt very much whether you can get what I call interverbal behavior. It's after you have uh, spoken many, many words and read many, many things and so on, there are certain tendencies for the topographies to be together. If, you, if, you're in a, if you are in a situation in which you may say house, you may very well say home too. So if I ask you to respond to me without repeating what I say, and I say house, you say home. And people almost invariably do that. There are standard things, color is red and so on. Uh, this is due to the frequency of, of contiguity, how often they have been together in a large repertoire. Well, you'd have to have a very large repertoire with the chimp before you, you got that. You could, you could teach it to say house when you say home, but that's not interverbal. That's just general. Uh, it's a response that has been set up by specific contingencies. Interverbals are something which come about through generalized contingencies of a very large, very great variety. Hmm. And when you go, when you get beyond that to what I call the autocritics and so on, I see no, I see no hope of building that up. Why? If I, if I say to you, as I just said, and I say something, as I just said, has the effect of alerting you to the fact that you are going to hear something again that I know and I'm not just repeating myself because I'm an idiot and so on, or that you haven't under responded so I'm saying it again and so on. Um, as, uh, to repeat, as I've just said, uh, uh, those are all critics in the sense that they affect what I'm going to say and make it have a different effect on you. And of course, they're extremely common. Um, they're very much a part of ordinary discourse. So I can't believe that you're going to get uh, a chimp to say, uh, as I said before, that's red. That's a point to red. Uh, there's no, the contingencies which lead me to say it are very subtle. There must be too big a repertoire needed. Oh, so you. So you do think there are differences between species in the size of the repertoires they can? Well, uh, I, you know, I, think it, I think it's far beyond any other species, because we have to teach them everything. You see, we, we are, our verbal behavior, Chomsky thinks I think we have to teach everybody what everything they say, but our verbal behavior is a product of an enormous contact for thousands of hours with speaking people. And that's where a lot of this comes from. You won't find very small children using many autocritics. They will, as their verbal behavior becomes more subtle, then they will begin to use them. Mm -hmm. Smooth over many.